Uh, we're talking today with Mr. Cornelius, or Casey DeYoung, uh, of Kentwood, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of Grand Valley State University. Uh, Mr. DeYoung, can you start by telling us a little bit about your own personal background? For instance, where were you born? Oh, well, I was born in the Netherlands and uh, came to America at the age of nine with a family of six. And oh. then my parents had three more children. All right. Now, in, in what year did your family come over to the States? 1929. All right. And where did they move to? Did they come to Michigan or somewhere else? They came else? to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why, why did they come there? Well, we had a relation here who sponsored us, mm -hmm. and that was the main reason we came here. Okay. Now, what kind of work did your father go into? Well, he actually, I come from a family of seafaring people. Mm -hmm. I have 13, 11 grandfathers who were captain of ships, so to be a merchant marina came easy to me. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, that's what I did. But we came here because my dad didn't have work over there. Mm -hmm. uh, shipping became difficult and hard because of trucks coming in, so mm -hmm. we came to America for that reason. Okay. And what did he do when he got here? Well, he ended up being in, uh, in construction, mm -hmm. and I worked with him for a while doing that. Uh, but he has, actually, his final years was in Muller Bakery Company, baking cakes, which mm -hmm. he loved. He thought he was the supreme cook. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now then, uh, did you finish high school here? No, I only went through the ninth. Okay. And I got a job making just the same amount of money my dad did. Mm -hmm. And my mother was very reluctant to send me to school when she had two checks coming in. You understand? Right, right. So, okay. And uh, I was happy not to go to school, but now I wish I had finished. But I'm just as educated as any high school guy mm -hmm. today. Uh, maybe more so. I uh, think so. Okay. Now, uh, were you paying attention to events going on in, in Europe uh, as the Nazis started to oh, yes. attack oh, yeah. things and oh, so yes. forth? Yeah. Uh, I was on my way to Pontiac, Michigan, doing a brick job when I got noticed about the Japan attacking. Mm -hmm. But even before that, uh, you know, you had the Germans invading Poland, and then they, they uh, conquered the Netherlands and France. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was well aware of that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't in Holland at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have relatives who were still back there? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I lost a, a niece by a German tank running over her by mistake, of course, mm -hmm. but whatever. That's what happened. And my uncle, my dad's brother, he ran a small motorboat. Mm -hmm. and so they kept in food pretty good because he ran his boat and mm -hmm. he, he kept in food pretty good because of that. Right. Okay. Now, when the war started, you were not eligible. You didn't have to be drafted because you were not a citizen. Is that correct? Oh, no. I was a citizen. You were a citizen by, by then. Yes. All right. I became a citizen in 35. Okay. Uh, now, but I noticed that you, you did not go into the military, you went into the Merchant Marine, and you didn't go into the Merchant Marine until 1943. So right. how was it that you managed to stay out of the military before that? Well, I was being, I was, oh, I was a bricklayer working on government mm -hmm. buildings that were important, like I went to a magnesium plant in mm -hmm. Nevada, okay. and I was exempt of duty for that reason. All right. And I left there because my wife had a baby and went to Michigan, and I followed regardless of the draft and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was going to be drafted when I got noticed or read an article that I could sail the seven seas with other clean-cut young men just like myself all right. in the Merchant Marine. And most of them were nice guys, but not all of them, you know. Okay. Now, explain the process of, of joining the Merchant Marine. Uh, where did you go to sign up? Well, I had to go to Detroit on a hitchhike. Mm -hmm. And uh, I passed the test and whatever, and very soon after that, I went to Sheepshead Bay, New York. Mm -hmm. And the process there was 16 weeks of training, same as you would get in the Army. Mm -hmm. And none of us liked that, you know. And, I, and then I heard that af after four weeks that if I wanted to go right away, I could go as a messman or in mm -hmm. the storage department. Mm -hmm. And I could go right. So in four weeks after I enlisted, I'm on my way to England. Okay. Now... You said that you were getting training just like they'd get in the army. Did they have you marching and shooting marching rifles? Marching and these, these crazy fire, uh, uh, four o'clock in the morning, pile out of bed in the mm -hmm. noon and stand out in the cold, mm -hmm. yeah. all this type of thing. Yeah. And gymnastics, all kinds right. of boxing. Now, were you older than most of the guys you were with? I may have been because I was about 24 at the mm -hmm. time, but some of them were 18, 19, whatever. Right. I would say, but there were old men in the Merchant Marine, mind you, and it's a good thing because they knew more than we did, you know, mm -hmm. experienced sailors. Okay. Now, had you had much sailing experience at all? Not really, not at that time, no. Mm -hmm. I, like I say, I came from a Marine yeah. family. 
All right. Uh, now, so they basically, you're only there training for four weeks. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Now then, where did you go from there? Where did you pick up your my first, first ship? My first trip was New York. Mm -hmm. all, in, all my trips were out of New York. Okay. But I ended up one time going through the Panama Canal, my last trip, and mm -hmm. I ended up in the Pacific, okay. the Philippines, on an ammunition ship, which wasn't, you know, I mean, uh, I could have been the first man in orbit had that been torpedoed. Right. right. Okay. Now let's, let's back up a little bit to the first voyage. Now, what ship did you go on first? Well, I think I was a Joshua Thomas. I have I went on five different ships, mm -hmm. but I went to England and we did our thing there. They unlo unloaded and we loaded things for North Africa. From there, I went to North Africa. Okay. Well, tell me about that first trip across the Atlantic. Uh, first of all, what kind of ship was it that you were sailing on? All of my ships were Liberty ships. Okay. Which some of them broke in half, you know. Mm -hmm. anyway, but they were. Slow, 11 knots was about the top speed of a Liberty ship. Right. Do you remember what you were carrying on that first load? No, I really okay. don't. Not to England or not mm -hmm. even to Africa. Okay. I remember, once going to Russia, we had the electric trains on deck. Mm -hmm. And I was, mostly you don't really pay much attention right. to what they're loading up with. You know? Right. Now, <laughs> uh, on that first trip, then, uh, were you sailing in a convoy? Pardon? Were you sailing in a convoy on that first trip? Oh, yes, all of them, all right. except the Pacific. We traveled alone on the okay. Pacific. Now, uh, in that convoy, did you have a sense of how many ships there were? No, not really, but I was on one. It was supposed to have been 105 ships. Now, mm -hmm. that was a big convoy, but you figure they're a mile apart. You're covering a lot of the ocean, you know, with right. 105 ships, and then all the escort ships besides. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, about when was it that you made your first voyage? Was it 1943? Uh, yes, yeah, then, uh, midsummer. Okay, midsummer. So that's a little bit after the worst of the U-boat scares. True. Uh, well, they were still bad at that time, mm -hmm. but the worst was early. Because I made a trip one time from New York to Alabama, mm -hmm. and then there was never a sunken ship out of sight. If the ship behind you was going out of sight, you could see one up forward, mm -hmm. you know. So a lot of ships were sunk along our coast. I don't think a lot of American people are right. aware of that. Right. So many were lost on the coast. Yeah. And certainly at the, at the beginning of that period, in 1942, the Americans had to learn how to protect their ships. Later, they did better. Oh, yes. But, oh, yeah. They sank a lot of subs, and then eventually they mastered that, right? Right. Uh -huh. Now, when you were making that first voyage, uh, were, was your convoy attacked? No, not that I know of. Mm -hmm. But I was in convoys where we lost ships. Uh, mm -hmm. The ship to Russia, we were getting ready to go up the Clyde River in Scotland, mm -hmm. and they sank a ship at 8 in the morning. I was just getting off watch. Mm -hmm. By the way, I always took the 4 to 8 watch because then you didn't have to work. Uh, but I mean, I didn't have to chip decks or paint or none of that because the Maritime had a very strong union and you couldn't work between 8 and you worked between 8 and 4. Mm -hmm. And I took the 4 to 8 watch, so uh, I never was in that painting detail or chipping, mm -hmm. none of that stuff. All right. Now, <coughs> what, tell me a little bit about the people who were serving on some of these ships. What kind of men wound up in the Merchant Marine? Well, a lot of them were American men, but they were foreigners. Mm -hmm. the Portuguese and different countries who got caught, uh, not at home or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they were usually capable seamen, mm -hmm. uh, more so than we were. We, a lot of us were young kids, you know, never been on a ship right. before or whatever. So they were... They were really the experienced seamen. But I remember Portuguese. I'm a Hollander. Portuguese mm -hmm. and Holland never did get along. Uh, <coughs> you know, they have a history of being mm -hmm. antagonists. So, But I got along good with one young fellow who was a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. and, and he was Portuguese. So, so. Okay. Now, what kinds of people commanded these ships? What did you know about your captains? Well, uh, sometimes they were young. Most of the time they were old, but the young ones... and. Sometimes they were drunks, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had nothing to do but sit up there and drink. And we had a chief engineer on every ship. He never mm -hmm. did anything. Why they had a chief engineer on a ship, I do not know, mm -hmm. except that he kept things lively up on the bridge. He was usually a drinker, usually, not always. <laughs> Maybe I should be careful. There might have been some nice ones, I don't know. But my opinion of them was usually they did nothing. Uh, right. except well, were, were they there to, you know, help solve problems or fix things if the really, engines broke down? Yes, but the first assistant, and sometimes we had one ship where the third assistant was the only one that could fix something that was mm -hmm. wrong, you know, so... Uh, yeah. Now, how often did you have problems come up with, with the engines or things like that? I, I only remember one problem, and that was when we went to Russia. The electric trains were 
pinned down by cables, heavy mm -hmm. cables. So after we got started back home, they threw the cables overside, mm -hmm. and they followed the ship, and they got tangled up in the screw. Ouch. So when we got back to England, they had to go into the dry dock and mm -hmm. untangle these. Uh, they were inch cables, right. they heavy cables, you know. And they had big timbers, 12, 10 or 12 square inch square timbers that these things sit on. They mm -hmm. threw them all overboard once we got back out to sea. I thought, why don't they leave them in Russia? Give it to them or something. Well, than I think one thing the Russians had a lot of was wood. Well, that's what we loaded <laughs> up with, wood. Yep. And to go back to England, mm -hmm. wood to me that looked uninterrupted, it looked to me like it might be crating material. Right. And they measured every one. Mm -hmm. There'd be a girl there, and we got paid overtime to be with them mm -hmm. and help measure this wood that went aboard the ship. Yeah. Now you said they had a girl there. Was it a, a, a Russian? Was yes, she, and I got you got to know them because, and one of them said she was an artist, and because you got every day I worked with her, mm -hmm. she, she gave me a painting about an old ten inch square mm -hmm. of a farm scene, a nice painting, mm -hmm. and on the back she wrote to Casey for remember. She meant to say to Casey right. in remember, mm -hmm. but she had on her to Casey for remember. Well, I didn't dare to bring it home mm -hmm. because I was married. Right. But the, the first officer on my ship, he said, I, he, he has it. Somewhere in the United States, this mm -hmm. picture is, and somebody wonders why it says to Casey for right. remember. So someday it will show up on Antiques Roadshow oh, or something yeah. like that. And, I, and and my I don't know who passed, Casey was. My wife has passed away, but uh, she might have not understood, you mm -hmm. know. That was, it was just seeing her on the dock. But, and uh, I learned a little Russian, and she learned a little mm -hmm. English. You know. Now, uh, I don't know, did... Were there opportunities for, for crewmen who wanted to make, have girlfriends ashore oh, yeah, to find some? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had what they call the interest club. Now, mm -hmm. I didn't drink during the war, mm -hmm. but I would go there mm -hmm. and uh, usually vodka that they had. Mm -hmm. And the guys always seemed sober until they left and got out in the cold air. Mm -hmm. For some reason, that made them. And I went home one time, and it was a British fella. And they, he said, what ship are you on, Yank? And I told him, he said, well, I'm hung up right behind you. Do you mind if I hang up on you? And he hung on me all the way back mm -hmm. to the ship. A couple of foreigners hanging out to each other you right. know, during the war. Yeah. Well, they may not have been used to drinking the vodka. It well, did, that could be. Yeah, didn't yeah. taste By like the way, much. the streets were all wood, mm -hmm. out of heavy timbers. Now, this is a dock area. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go to Mermansk. I went to a place called Archangel. Archangel, you're right. Yeah. And, uh, we, I went there one time with a friend. Oh, by the way, the Russian government gave us, I think it was 60 or 100 rubles. Mm -hmm. But they could not give the American sailors any money. Mm -hmm. So they gave them a bottle of perfume, which mm -hmm. caused a little bit of ill feeling. Right. Uh, but there was nothing to buy. There's no stores. But mm -hmm. we went to Archangel, and this friend of mine bought Russian hats. and this. He had them in a pack sack. Now, the last tram was leaving to go back to our ship, and we were talking to a couple of little young Russian boys, mm -hmm. and just as the tram started, one of them grabbed his sack of goodies mm -hmm. and ran off, and he could just watch him run because mm -hmm. he wasn't going to get off that tram. It was the last tram leaving. I often think of that, these young Russian boys. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that, that trip up, up to Russia? I mean, how was that a different experience from the ones across the Atlantic or down to Africa? Well, it was longer. We gathered in New Scotland. That's mm -hmm. where they started. Now, we did not lose the ship, but there was a convoy before mine that lost out of 48 ships. I understand only four of them made it, mm -hmm. but we didn't lose any ship going, and we didn't lose any coming back. And mm -hmm. I went in the wintertime, and it really wasn't that cold. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm surprised because I read of some ships, the ice up and right. whatever. Can't say it was that bad. We were issued very heavy material mm -hmm. in case we went over the side. And we would last. We could last 20 minutes. They said, if mm -hmm. if you had this outfit on, right. big rubber outfit that mm -hmm. tied up and closed up around the neck. But uh, and we practiced putting mm -hmm. that on, whatever. Uh, well, was that a risk? I mean, did did crewmen fall off their ships with some regularity? Never, never happened on my ship. Mm -hmm. I had a good friend. Uh, he got sick. Mm -hmm. He went to a Russian destroyer, and then two days later captain told me that he passed away and they mm -hmm. buried him to where we could see it you know mm -hmm. uh, at sea uh, he got us alongside and, uh, and he was a good friend of mine a little older than me mm -hmm. uh, policeman from New York uh, he had been a policeman mm -hmm. whatever. a nice person uh, okay now when you're on these ships and you're when you're off duty what kinds of things did you do um, personally I hired a guy to take my place like in England mm -hmm. 
and uh, it was, uh, I forget whether it was a dollar an hour or a dollar a watch, but it wasn't that terribly expensive, I remember. Mm -hmm. And I would leave the ship, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be on the ship. But I spent a lot of time in English cemeteries, that might sound funny, mm -hmm. but basically a lot, I spent a lot of time in, in an English cemetery, because they were so old, mm -hmm. 15, 1400, right. and then you, you'd, you'd look and there would be three or four graves, all babies, mm -hmm. three months, mm -hmm. one year. Uh, and I think back to those days, babies didn't live long mm -hmm. like they do today, you know. But uh, that's true. And I crossed the um, uh, London Bridge, you know, the London mm -hmm. Bridge is falling down. Right. I crossed that many times. And I ended up helping rebuild that in Arizona later, mm -hmm. never thinking during a war when I crossed it mm -hmm. that I'd end up working on it in Lake Havasu, Arizona, right. where the bridge is built today. Right. Because they moved that, I guess, back around 1970 or so. In the 70s, yeah. yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Now, uh, when you were on the ship and you were at sea, uh, what kind of duties did you normally have? Mine was always steering mm -hmm. and look out. You'd steer for two hours, stand look out for 20 minutes. Even the steering was all totally in the dark, mm -hmm. but you're looking at that little light and the compass. One interesting mm -hmm. story, one evening uh, we were going somewhere near the 360 degree. Anyway, we were heading almost north and off but. 50, 60 degrees to the right was a big star. And I said to the chief mate, that's probably the north star. He said, mm -hmm. yeah. And I said, now is that too north or just a little? No, he said, I think it's too north. Well, the captain was a good friend of his, and mm -hmm. he was up there. And he said, no, he said, it's not too north. And they argued about it. Well, finally, he said, well, swing it around, Case. He said, put that sucker right on top of that mast, mm -hmm. which would put us dead center. Right. And the north star is about three degrees off too north. Mm -hmm. It's not too north. Anyway, they went off to dinner, and the third mate relieved them, and uh, the proper procedure is he asked me, what are you heading? And I told mm -hmm. him, and I said, not long ago we were going too north because the captain wanted to see if the North Star was really too north. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, baloney. And mm -hmm. I stuck my hand out and said, I bet you $5. And he grabbed it, and he paid me. Mm -hmm. He didn't want it for a while until I said, I'll go to the crew mess, and I'll tell him what the kind of guy you are. You mm -hmm. make a bet and you don't pay. Well, he forked over the money. Okay. Now, when you're serving as a, a, a lookout, was there anything to see? No, and I still can't understand. Uh, we have what they call a crow's nest that's mm -hmm. on top of the mast. Mm -hmm. Of all the five ships I was on, no captain required us to go in the crow's nest, mm -hmm. not a one. They always had to go up forward on the peak, uh, the forepeak, mm -hmm. on the bow, and uh, stand. And I, I question whether that was so wise. The guys on the Bridge were way up high. They could mm -hmm. see a lot better than you could. Yeah. In the daytime, you might spot a periscope, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it didn't make sense to me, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when you're sailing uh, on the ship and you were not on duty, what did you do? Oh, then you, you just you, you slept, mm -hmm. or you spent time in the mess hall. Mm -hmm. By the way, we had our crew had a messman or a waiter. Mm -hmm. The Navy had their mess hall and mm -hmm. a waiter. And the officers, Miss Hall, had a waiter. Mm -hmm. I think three unnecessary guys on the trip uh, uh, during the war. Every ship had that. Mm -hmm. And because the uh, maritime has such a strong union, that was one of the rules. But mm -hmm. I think during the war, they could have eliminated that. Uh, there's 45 crewmen, you know. Mm -hmm. And they could have walked that 15 feet to the passageway and got their own meal. But you sat, and he, you gave the order to the waiter, and mm -hmm. he went and got your meal. Well, did you have, did, could you make any choices about what oh, you were no, going to eat? Oh, yeah, we had choice of three meats every meal, even mm -hmm. at breakfast. We okay. had a choice of three meats at every meal. We, got, we were fed very, very good. Okay. Did you get the same food that the Navy guys got? Oh, well, everybody got okay. the same, yes. Because yeah, the Navy was sort of famous for having better food than anybody else did. So if you were eating the same food, well, then I think aboard ship they had because mm -hmm. they had the, the freezer there, they had all the meat you want. I spent one time coming back to New York. They paid me overtime to throw meat away, mm -hmm. and and I said, why are we doing this? And he said, well, okay, you're going home when you get in case, but these these guys who go out on the ship next time, they don't want this old meat, mm -hmm. they want the fresh meat. Right. But I'm talking quarter quarter cows that we were lifting up mm -hmm. passageway and throwing overboard, you know. Yeah. Just so we could, have, and here meat was rationed in the United States. Yeah. Those little things stick in my mind, okay. the waste. Now, you talked about uh, Navy personnel being on these ships. Uh, what was their job? Well, they, we had eight 20 millimeter guns, mm -hmm. 
and we had a three-inch anti-aircraft gun, and we had a five-inch surface gun. Mm -hmm. And I, on every ship, I volunteered to be on a 20 millimeter of a gun. I didn't bring it, but I have a mm -hmm. little, on my last trip, I took the little thing off the wall with my name on it, where I was on gun number, 20 millimeter gun number eight. Mm -hmm. And my job was strictly a loader, mm -hmm. but I'd rather be out there doing that. It was optional, you mm -hmm. could volunteer for that. But on every ship, I volunteered to be on a 20 millimeter gun. Okay. Now, did the uh, guards on your ship ever actually shoot at anything? We we were attacked once in a merchant in the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. where we fired and we used our smoke bombs, mm -hmm. and all got in the smoke where you couldn't see each other. And I was being worried about you going to run into somebody. Mm -hmm. so, now, that, what, what were you being attacked by? One plane? Air, air plane. Or, well, or? I don't know. I, I really don't know. So you didn't see I him? do know they fired the guns and mm -hmm. we got in this smoke deal. Mm -hmm. And that's why I got a, what they call a combat bar mm -hmm. uh, from that. Okay. Now, uh, tell me a little bit about some of the different places that you visited. Uh, in England, where did you go? Well, you were in London, obviously. Where else did you go? Well, it was mostly London. Mm -hmm. I would even rent a room in London. Mm -hmm. uh, and one time there was a raid, and there we were going in the backyard in this little dugout shed mm -hmm. in the backyard or whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, I just never stayed aboard ship in uh, in England. Mm -hmm. I always went somewhere. And oh, and one time we missed the ship. I, we ran into a, a, a dock or something leaving on a windy day. Mm -hmm. So we came back in, and then the captain gave us shore leave. Mm -hmm. and he shouldn't have, because once well, I'm in a theater and it flashed on the screen, everybody from the such and such ship, go back to your ship. Well, we said, we're off legally, we ain't going back. We got back, the ship was gone. Mm -hmm. So now we go to the company representative, and right. we went across England by train, mm -hmm. and the Navy took our ship through the English Channel mm -hmm. to the other side of England, and that was one thing that happened there, just unusual, mm -hmm. but uh, the captain did give us shore leave, legal shore leave, and then he got orders to sail. Mm -hmm. so it was a windy day, and the ship is empty. They're hard to handle. Right. The, the wind can move them very easily. Now, when you went down to the Mediterranean, where did you go? I went to Algiers, mm -hmm. <clears throat> right after the invasion. Okay. The big invasion. And, and so what did the harbor at Algiers look like when you got there? Well, there was the, uh, the not that much damage because mm -hmm. the fire was mostly at the ships when they right. came in, whatever. Right. But that was my first experience with the Arabs mm -hmm. and the man riding the donkey, but the wife running behind mm -hmm. and this type of thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was the worst place I was in really was as far as well, what you might say, being a high end of the world. That would have been Russia. Mm -hmm. That was that's what things I think were the worst. They they had a stove in Russia where if four people were using the stove, they could use the stove. Mm -hmm. and otherwise, they had to go to the commissary and pick up their meal mm -hmm. and either eat it there on a picnic table or carry it home. Mm -hmm. Most of them got their meal, fish and cabbage, I remember it was, mm -hmm. and then they would take it home. But Okay. Now, which, which are you just talking about the citizens of the town or the people working at the harbor? Or? Well, uh, I think where I was really was more like you say a harbor, mm -hmm. and I wasn't really in the city. Right. There were people who worked there or whatever, but that's mm -hmm. the way they lived in big mm -hmm. dormitories, mm -hmm. and that's the way they ate. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, did you see much of the, the, the people in Algiers, or were a lot of the ones that you saw oh, yeah, French oh, yeah. ones? I, I went to the Casbah once, mm -hmm. which is, uh, we could go there, there was no restriction, mm -hmm. but uh, army personnel were not. Right. But I, we met, I was with a friend, and we met two army guys, and I went into the Casbah mm -hmm. a little way. It's a pretty dangerous place. It's mm -hmm. all uphill. It's mm -hmm. all very narrow passageways. And I can see if you are in trouble, there's no way you're going to get out of there. Mm -hmm. you know? It was, to me, a, a dangerous little deal. I can see where the Army didn't allow the servicemen to go there. Mm -hmm. It's all out here, it's all uphill. It's all on a big mountainside. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful from yeah. the sea. All white. Looks beautiful from the sea. Mm -hmm. Now, did you go to any other ports in the Mediterranean, or were you just there on that one trip? Well, no, that's the only place I went, but Oran. Oran mm -hmm. was not too far away. Right. We could go there, mm -hmm. uh, whatever. You know, and of course, unloading, well, all takes a little bit of time. You know? mm -hmm. By the way, in Russia, that was all done by women, mm -hmm. the unloading. And in Russia, I had a pair of leather gloves that were fur-lined. Mm -hmm. And those days, they cost a dollar. 
Well, he got scuffed up a little bit working on deck, and mm -hmm. I threw him on the dock, figuring, well, these, one of these women might pick him up and use him. Mm -hmm. That's the only place where they had a soldier at the end of our gangway, and you had to show a pass when mm -hmm. you left. Anyway, he came aboard to the captain and said, whoever threw those gloves in, either come down there and pick them up or kick them in the water, but you just couldn't leave them there. Mm -hmm. So I went back down there and picked them back up. And I, when I used to leave the ship, uh, I'd always have a pack of cigarettes underneath my pass. Mm -hmm. And boy, were they slick. They, I don't know how they, but uh, they would look at the pass and this and that, and, and then that pack of cigarettes would be going somewhere. He was slick about mm -hmm. slipping that into his pocket somewhere and whatever, and a pack of cigarettes was something to us, you know. Right. Well, were you bringing it with the idea that, that he was going to take it, or were you trying to give it to somebody no, else? No, I just did it to give him a pack of cigarettes mm -hmm. and whatever, because I wasn't sneaking anything ashore, really. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't, the worst thing you could bring ashore in Russia would be a magazine. Mm -hmm. They did not want you to bring a magazine ashore. And I imagine it's, you know, our American magazine might show an American family coming out of the door with suitcases and right. a car and a driver with a boat attached, and sure. they didn't want that. Right? Yeah, it was all that capitalist propaganda. You, know, you oh. couldn't have that. Right. Yeah, they did not want you to, do, and they were very backward. Mm -hmm. Later, I read there were guys who entered Germany and they took light bulbs home because mm -hmm. they figured if they get home, they could get light out of the thing or something. I don't know. That's how uh, they, that's how backward they were, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it was that was the most backward nation I was in. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Now, uh, aside from going down to Africa once, going over to Russia. Uh, back and forth to England. Where else did you go? Well, England most of the time, and mm -hmm. from England to Africa, but mostly England and back home. Right. By the way, we were allowed two days off mm -hmm. for every week on the ship. Mm -hmm. So I always had time to go home. I was married at right. the time. Right. I had a young daughter. Uh, I could go home, uh, for, and they never were that sticky. I could stay three, four days longer, mm -hmm. and nobody would say anything. But when you got back, you right away went to the Union Hall mm -hmm. and picked a ship, and you were, you were allowed to turn down two ships, mm -hmm. but the third one you had to take. Right. So you had to be very careful. If you took the third one, you might get a real dog. Right. And the only, I never turned down a ship. Mm -hmm. Some guys to might turn down, they might get aboard a ship, but it was nothing but foreigners or something, mm -hmm. you know, and, and whatever. Or they didn't like the cargo that was being loaded, I don't know, but mm -hmm. I never, I always took that. I usually tried to get one that was going into dry dock. Because mm -hmm. my wife always came back with me, mm -hmm. so we spent a little more time together in New York. And then right. I would tell her, on a night where I don't come back, then you know that we've been ordered not to leave the ship and mm -hmm. we're going to leave. Right. There's no way I could tell her you mm -hmm. know, in advance. Yeah, because you, weren't supposed, you weren't supposed to be letting people know when things were shipping That's out right. or where they yeah, were going we, or anything. I couldn't go back ashore. And, right. Uh, now, how was your family, were you sending money back home to your family? She automatically got $100 a month. Mm -hmm. The minute I got on a ship, she got $100 a month, which said that was pretty good money. Mm -hmm. Now, did she have a job on top of that, or was no, she just not, taking care well, of the kids? Well, she could have had, but mm -hmm. my wife didn't. Uh, she had a daughter, and mm -hmm. you know, she was not one to work, whatever. Uh, what was I going to say? I thought of something about that. Oh, we, we got paid, by the way, at the end of the trip mm -hmm. in cash. Mm -hmm. you, got, you, entered, you, you got paid in the, always in the uh, officer's mess hall. You entered one door, you got paid, and you went out the other door. When you went out the other door, that passage would be lined with men waiting for money. Different crew members owed them money from mm -hmm. gambling or whatever. <laughs> and they were, this is one way you were going to get your money. You knew he had the mm -hmm. money. And you knew once he went off that ship, you wouldn't go and see him again. Mm -hmm. Of the five different ships I was on, I never went back to New York and met a, a former crewman. Mm -hmm. Never. I ran into one Navy guy one time who said one of our ships was torpedoed, mm -hmm. but it did make harbor. And then the ship was sunk at a Normandy invasion as a beachhead or mm -hmm. on purpose. Right. You know? So that ship was sunk twice. But I wasn't on it, but mm -hmm. uh, that's what he told me. You know? Okay. Now, uh, at some point, you mentioned you actually went down to the Caribbean and through the Panama Canal and yes, a across yeah. the Pacific. That was a surprise. When everything was marked United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, when I get to England, I'm going to go to Holland because mm -hmm. the war in Europe was over with right. at that time. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, we go to Alabama and we load up uh, this ammunition mm -hmm. and go through the Panama Canal, and I was at anchor 
in the Philippines because mm -hmm. we were at a, a, an ammunition ship. They wouldn't let mm -hmm. us dock. Right. We were at anchor all by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I would go to Manila once or twice every two weeks, once a week or every two weeks, mm -hmm. hitchhike to Manila and get the mail, mm -hmm. stay at the Siemens Club. It was nice trip to me. I like. And I one time a dump truck picked me up, soldiers, mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't get in the cab because that was loaded. He said, if you want to ride, you can get in the back. So I did. And then he, well, they slowed down and they said, we're going to go to the suicide pass, so lay down for a while because mm -hmm. there's still snipers up mm -hmm. there. That's just a little thing I remember. Right. Nothing happened, but I remember them telling me, lie down for a while because we're going through suicide. They call it suicide pass. You know? mm -hmm. Now, when you got to the Philippines, was the war still going on uh, with Japan? No, they had to. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 11 months I was there. Uh, and Manila was, the fake money was lying all over the streets, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the Japanese money. Uh, right. Not ja the money they printed. Mm -hmm. You could pick it up on the street. I picked up some and gave it to grandkids and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there would be a lot of Navy ships in the harbor, and boy, and, and, uh, and the, 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 uh, the shore would just be lined with all white uniforms waiting. Mm -hmm to get back on the launches and go back to their respective ships. You know, a lot of shorties there. The Japanese had pretty well, in the 11 months, were out of there, out mm -hmm. of Manila. Yeah. War was pretty well over in Manila, but a lot of damage there in mm -hmm. Manila. Uh, and did you see much of the civilian population in the oh, Philippines? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And they were very friendly. They were mm -hmm. mostly Catholic. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys who were in England, this and that, it was easy to run around with ladies. but. Not that easy in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. They were Catholic and they were a little more, you know, leave me alone type. But really, it mm -hmm. was a, there was a big difference between mm -hmm. the British and the Filipinos. The Filipinos were very strong Catholic. Because mm -hmm. yeah, the Philippines would sort of have the reputation of, of being the opposite. Or I guess if you were in the right place in Manila, there would be women who were available, I guess. But you're talking about ones who are still living with their families and that right. kind of thing. And, yeah. And oh, they, yeah. No, they and were, then they're no, protected they were, more carefully. Very subdued, very right. nice, nice, nice people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, uh, did you stop any place else in the Pacific while you were sailing around? No. On the way home, we stopped at a place called Ine, Ine and, and we talk? Yeah. Ine we talk. And that, to me, looked like it was about four feet above the sea level. It was. If they ever had a storm, mm -hmm. I don't know how anybody could be on that place because mm -hmm. it was, if you looked at it, all you saw was a, a, a sandy beach. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, we did have some beer there. By the way, when it came to once in a while, you get a place where everybody was given two beers. Mm -hmm. And then I was very popular because I didn't drink and mm -hmm. everybody knew it. And then you get a <laughs> lot of friends when you <laughs> two, two extra beers that you don't want, you know. Uh, <clears throat> that happened rarely, but it did happen on occasion. Okay. Now, uh, you left the Merchant Marine in, in 1946. Uh, did you just decide it was, the war was over and it was time to go back to your oh, family? Oh, no, automatically. In fact, I, let, I, got, I got off in Seattle, which is unusual. Usually, I got off in New York. Mm -hmm. you know, Seattle is a lot further away from home, right. you know. But, and uh, I went home right away on leave, paid a guy to take my leave. Mm -hmm. And then I got a telegram come back to the ship, the, 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 the company was mad that some of the personnel were away. Because mm -hmm. one man went to New York and said, I don't want to go back to Seattle. Mm -hmm. Pay me here. Right. So then they got noticed, you, if you got any more men away from the ship, you, and I got, it made me a little angry at the guy who had gone to the office in New York mm -hmm. because I got this telegram, I had to go back to Seattle. Mm -hmm. So I made that trip twice, you know. But I had to go back to get paid off. Right. You know? And so I guess they were paying you more than it cost to take the train out to Seattle and back. Uh, the, by that time, they owed me 11 months' wages. Okay. That would be That's quite why a bit. I think the Merchant Marine had a reputation for making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You've got to remember now, with 11 months when I went to the Philippines, I didn't spend much money. Mm -hmm. And I was accruing a big payday. Right. When I got paid off in cash, well, it was up to two, three thousand dollars to get mm -hmm. amount. To be honest with you, I don't really know what I got paid. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was a fixed amount, but mm -hmm. I'm not aware exactly whether I paid by the week or by the day. I don't know, but mm -hmm. uh, I always got paid in cash, and I'd always come home with a lot of cash. Okay. Know. Now, you were basically paid for the amount of time you were actually on the ship. Is that right? Only on the ship, yeah. So when you were in the Philippines and you were... Well, then I was paid. As long as I was away from home on okay. the ship, I was paid. Okay. If I was torpedoed, I got literature home. Mm -hmm. uh, from these guys who are trying to get me to sell. Now they said, you know, we didn't even get paid when we got torpedoes. Uh, mm -hmm. 
the ship was gone, why should we pay you guys? You're not right. a ship. Uh, so forth. But anyway, the pay to me, well, it was better than what Navy guys would get, which caused a little argument with mm -hmm. the armed guard. Mm -hmm. You guys get more than we get. I said, you're eating the same food, and I'm eating the same food you are. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to buy our own clothes. Mm -hmm. I had to buy my own transportation right. when I went home. Yeah, and of course, then they got, of course, after the war, they got veterans' benefits and so forth, and you guys didn't. Well, that's the thing. Uh, they finally, when we got our Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. It was too late to go to college. Right. For goodness sakes, I was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And you, as far as a loan for a home, by that time I had owned five different homes. Right. You know, I built five of them because I was a builder. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I, I didn't enjoy any of that. Today I am. I, I have the VA mm -hmm. and I get my pills. Mm -hmm. I have five pills a day, which are taken care of by the VA. So I had that benefit. Mm -hmm. But we missed out on the, the big deal early. Right. Like a college education for free. My son has that, and it mm -hmm. paid off good for him. He's retired now. Mm -hmm. Now, are, are there other events or things that happened to you while you were uh, on these ships or in these different places that you were, that kind of stand out in your mind that you haven't talked I about? Yeah, the first trip, one guy murdered another one, and I was reminded of the little message: uh, "Sail the seven seas with other clean-cut young men, just mm -hmm. like yourself." Uh, he, they, they both got to drinking, and then um, mm -hmm. the, the boatswain said, well, you guys are drunk, go back to your room, and mm -hmm. then one of them ended up stabbing the other one or whatever. And I came back from shore, I just got some theater tickets, and uh, that was in Algiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, there he was, handcuffed to the rail by the galley, and I uh, mm -hmm. said, well, he said he just killed so-and-so. Now, he stayed in Africa. By the way, our policemen were the Coast Guard. They mm -hmm. were our official. Mm -hmm. They they gave me my honorable discharge mm -hmm. and every, they had the records of what right. ships I was on. Right. Okay. Uh, are there other events that you can think of or things that you remember particularly? Well, there was one time uh, the, the cook said, we're not having a hot meal today because Charney Noble isn't working. And Charney Noble is the name of the chimney mm -hmm. for the galley. Right. Not the main stack of the ship, but... But one for the galley. And that was Charlie Noble. Charlie Noble is not working right, and, and but it's a window, uh, but I can't give a hot meal. Well, they said, we're not going to turn two mm -hmm. unless we get a hot meal. Well, then, and we're not, they even made a remark, I'm not even budging from this seat. Well, then a, a British destroyer got very near us and dropped two depth charges. And to me, it, I, we all felt that the ship had been torpedoed because our mm -hmm. ship jumped. And... To me, it was like sitting in a 50-gallon drum and somebody hitting it with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like. I thought we'd been torpedoed. Now there's a mad dash for the door to get mm -hmm. out of there, and they couldn't get the door open because the door came in. Now they had a meeting we ought to have that door removed. That door shouldn't be out there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they got out of their seats. That was the only time that a depth charge went off near me, and I'm surprised the, the noise they make and uh, mm -hmm. how it did make our ship jump in the water. Okay. Now, did you sail through uh, any big storms? Oh, yes. And oh, yeah. What was it like being on a Liberty ship in the middle of one of those? Well, it bounced around good or mm -hmm. whatever. But our gangway broke loose one time, and we got turned to. That's the only time I got turned to because I was on a watch where I was supposed to work. But mm -hmm. anyway, in the emergency, I went down there, and the guy who went on the outside, over the side of the ship, sometimes he would disappear in the water. The ship would mm -hmm. list to the left and a big wave would come, and he'd actually disappear, and he was off the ship hanging out of this thing working on, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we got it fixed. We got back in the mess hall, and then the bosun said to me, Casey, he said, well, you go up in the forepeak, and there's a padlock there, and lock that forepeak, which was unlocked. I mm -hmm. thought it was a stormy night, nobody out. But anyway, I went up there, and as soon as I got up there, <clears throat> I could tell the ship was going down, 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 and I looked up, and there's this big wave looking right. like 100 feet up. And I knew that ship was going to dive into that way. And that's right underneath the gun top, which mm -hmm. has four posts holding it up. Mm -hmm. I wrapped my arms around this post, mm -hmm. and it straightened me right out, the water did. It took my shoes off, which mm -hmm. I never got back. Mm -hmm. And that's the fastest a hounder ever ran from the bow of a ship to the <laughs> ship, barefooted. Right. And I told him, if you want that four-peak locked, 
You go up and do it yourself, but I'm not going back out there. So why did they need the four-peak lock in the first place? Well, it place? had valuable stuff in there, okay. like brass locks, mm -hmm. brass clocks, uh, valuable mm -hmm. stuff that somebody might go up and steal. Mm -hmm. uh, we had stuff, uh, when you ship and get ashore, a guy would, wouldn't mind grabbing a nice brass clock mm -hmm. you know, off the wall. Uh, now, were there some places where that stuff would be easier to unload than others? I mean, would you, like, would they... No, the only, if you talk about unloading, mm -hmm. uh, when we were in the Philippines, the captain asked the steward, he said, is somebody ashore doing our laundry? And he said, no. Well, there were a lot of blue bedspreads, which was what we had. They mm -hmm. were hanging on the lines ashore. Mm -hmm. and these guys were taking them and selling them, you mm -hmm. know. By the way, you could get $20 a sheet in North Africa. Mm -hmm. By the time I got there, it was down to $4. <laughs> Too but many they ships. said that was originally because the British or the yeah. Arabs run around mm -hmm. in that type of clothing. But uh, they were selling sheets for 20, 20 bucks a sheet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, how, to look back on the whole thing now, how do you think your time in the Merchant Marine maybe uh, affected I, you as I, a person? I, I loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had not been married mm -hmm. and, and whatever, I would have remained. I would have liked to have been uh, a seaman. To mm -hmm. me, I liked the life. Uh, it was, a, it was a nice way to live, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I definitely would have done that, but being married, whatever, my right. first thought was, when the war is over, get back home and get back to work. Right. My boss called me up, said, hey, you want to come back to work? I'll pay you double what you were paid before. Mm -hmm. and I became the foreman there, and then eventually I went into business for myself. Mm -hmm. And it was successful. Uh, then I was asked to go to Arabia by the church, and I went to Arabia mm -hmm. for six years. And what did you do there? I built churches okay. for the Reformed Church. All right, so Arabia. Uh, not churches, hospitals. Okay. Excuse me, the okay. hospitals. That was it Saudi Arabia or a different country? No, Saudi Arabia. I was in Bahrain. Okay. You yeah. could see Saudi Arabia from where yeah. we were. But in, in, in Saudi Arabia, they, they, they don't like people... No. Christians coming in and doing different things. No, but, and if you but did go there, you, you could not do your own worship, right. even in your own home. You mm -hmm. weren't supposed to, but you mm -hmm. did. <clears throat> no, uh, I built a bill hospital there, and I went to the country of Oman. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with the Merchant Marine, of mm -hmm. course. And I ended up building a high school in Iraq, but in Basra, Iraq. Mm -hmm. And they, then they kicked us all out after that, after we got the school built, mm -hmm. which was cost us 80,000 dinars, which in dinars was worth $4. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a lot of money. Anyway, a nice high school. Last I heard, the oil company was using it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it sounds like you've had a really pretty full life and, and career there. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Pardon? I didn't get that. I'd just like to thank you for talking to us today. Oh, okay. Right. No, I enjoyed it. I hope it served a purpose? Certainly did. We learned quite yeah. a bit. And I enjoyed it. I'm glad uh, you, you did it nice. It was easy for me to answer. I probably missed a boat on some things, but... Ah, not too much. Couldn't think of everything. All right. Okay? Uh, thank you. Okay. There we go. And that should be a wrap. And if they're paying now, attention... Now, where was the camera working? Okay. Uh, well, there's a camera on me, and presumably that camera is on you. Yeah, I didn't see a camera working. <laughs> well, I guess we'll find out. But that's the, that camera is focused directly on you on that chair, and this one's on me. Oh. So they, so they basically they make these are the recording. But this one was working. I never saw any lights on or anything. Well, it's plugged in. So. Huh? It's plugged in. Oh. So I assume they know what they're doing. Okay.